In honor of Dia de los Muertos, it seems pertinent to talk about death. After all, death is a part of life. This is true no matter how much we may not want to accept it. In times past, we had an easier time accepting death because it was a part of everyday life. In today's age, death has become sequestered away. It has become taboo, and so has talking about it. This is a tragedy, because death is something that each and every one of us will face. One day, as people, we're going to have to accept that you do not have to dread death in order to value life. We have to take talking about death out of the box of taboo. The taboo around talking about death, which is especially prevalent in the Western cultures in the world, harms people. Society has created all kinds of cultural adaptations that are designed to keep people from being conscious of their mortality. The discourse around death reflects the attitude that death is bad and wrong and serves to perpetuate the idea that it is the worst thing that can happen and is therefore something to dread. As a result, many people are in a state of, let's call it death denial. And this death denial contributes to a greater sense of wrongness, shock, and pain when death suddenly does inevitably enter one's life experience in some way. In the modern era, due to our attitudes towards death, we have a very dysfunctional and, to be honest with you, an ever-worsening relationship with death, which is a natural part of life. Part of this taboo surrounding death puts spiritual teachers, such as myself, in a rather difficult position. The taboo surrounding death suggests that the collective belief is that death is in and of itself bad and wrong, and so is talking about it. If death is bad and wrong, it seems that we are all inevitably headed towards a bad and wrong fate in the future, and this increases our fear of death as well as our fear of the future. It creates resistance. This extreme resistance to death, it can make the transition that is the process of death one of deep suffering. It can also make the pain that we experience when we lose someone to death much, much more painful. It is rather ironic that the taboo around death is thought to benefit people, but it actually serves to make the experience of death more painful for people. You'll notice that our judgment of badness and wrongness is often less about death in and of itself than it is about the circumstances of a death. For example, if a very old person dies, we tend to think that death's okay. We say things like, it was time. But if a person who is not old dies, we think that it's not supposed to happen and is therefore wrong. If a person dies saving another person's life or serving their country in a war, that death is seen as something honorable and therefore not wrong, necessarily. If someone is murdered, that death is seen as bad and wrong. But if a soldier kills an enemy, that murder is seen as good. If someone murders other people, that person's death is often seen as a good thing. After all, many people still celebrate the death penalty, and let's be honest, many more of us still celebrate when the bad guy dies in a movie. The samurai practice seppuku. In this practice, it was considered honorable to commit suicide as opposed to falling into the hands of the enemy. But let's fast forward. Most of the Western world today view suicide as morally bad and wrong. But wait, wait, wait. Nonetheless, there's a debate currently that rages on regarding the physician-assisted suicide, which is legal in many countries. Even the debate around abortion is a debate around death. What all this means is that even today, given the right circumstance, many people believe that death is, in fact, good. You understand the confusion? <laughs> what I'm doing by showcasing this confusion and mass mixed messaging that we keep giving and getting about death is trying to help you become conscious of humanity's complicated attitude towards death, especially based on circumstances. It's important to notice your own relationship to the circumstances of death and how they influence your perspective of rightness, goodness, wrongness, and badness relative to death itself. The taboo around death also means that those of us who see the danger in death remaining taboo and who are thus brave enough to talk about death end up being demonized and expected to send some pretty mixed messages to the public. For example, we're told that it's okay to help someone who is dying of a terminal illness, for example, by explaining to them that they will experience death as a relief, that it's okay to let go, and that there's nothing to be afraid of. We're told that it's okay to tell someone who has lost a loved one that their loved one is at peace and is not suffering, and that their loved one is not, quote, gone in the spiritual sense, thus making death okay. However, when we talk publicly about death, if we talk in any other way than to give the impression that we see death in and of itself as bad and as wrong, period, the end, 
were at risk of being accused of being pro-death, and thus, even worse, pro-suicide. This could not be further from the truth. So take me for an example. I do not glorify death. Instead, like every spiritual teacher who has come before me, <laughs> I see the universal value inherent in life. I also see the universal value inherent in death. But this truth doesn't matter, because people have decided that death has no value and is bad and wrong, and that anyone who says otherwise is a threat. I find this heartbreaking. Why? Because this way of thinking will harm people immensely when the time comes that death enters their own life experience, and it will. For this reason, I think it's important to ask yourself, what do you think about death? Is death bad and wrong? Should talking about death be taboo? What is the benefit and what is the harm inherent in death being taboo? On top of this, you have the difficulty of talking to people about the reality of why death happens in the grand scheme of the universe when it does, and trying to convey that reality in a way that does not make people feel guilty or at fault for a death happening. So now that I've said all that, let's have a real conversation about death. The first thing that is important to know is that death is experienced so differently from one dimension to the next. For example, from many of the higher dimensional spaces, there is no such thing as death. There is no endedness. There is only recycling of consciousness and energy. There is also a much different perception of time. One lifetime occurs like the blink of an eye. One lifetime is only a very small snapshot of existence, like walking into and out of a theater. Of course, we all know that the experience of death in the physical, facing death ourselves and having someone we love die is quite different than that. Most people absolutely do experience life as all there is, and as lasting a long period of time. We experience death as an end, and as a deep loss. Death is very similar to slipping into a dream, so is coming into life. You will close your perceptual awareness to one reality and open it to the next. I want you to recall that in a dream you're so attached to what is occurring, as if it's the only reality, but then you wake up, and suddenly it isn't all of who you are and it isn't as important, because the truth of you is much different, much bigger, much more. Death, first and foremost, is a transitioning. It's a drastic change in perspective. When you die, the stream of consciousness that is feeding and continually creating your thought form, which is really the idea of you that exists separate from your physical embodiment, as well as is feeding your physical body, will withdraw. First from the physical form. When it does this, the body is no longer fed by a stream of consciousness and will begin to dissipate. It will demanifest. We experience this on the physical plane as decomposition. It will also withdraw from the thought form, which is your identity, and that too will dissipate. It will withdraw all the way back to collective consciousness. It essentially goes through a process of disidentification. You become part of oneness again. You lose a sense of separateness. This is experienced in terms of felt perception as returning back to love. This process of dissipation of a thought form, just like the dissipation of the body, is not immediate, which is why the ghost of someone sometimes still has enough energy in it to influence things in the physical dimension. We call this a haunting. This is especially true if the thought form is charged with energy due to a sudden death or unfinished business with someone in the physical plane. Most of the entities that we call ghosts are these dissipating thought forms. They're not being fed by a stream of consciousness. So they must draw energy to maintain themselves from somewhere else, such as another person's energy field or other people focusing on them or electric currents or energy generating minerals, etc. The first form of manifestation into the physical form is light. For this reason, when beings demanifest from the physical dimension and reverse this process of manifestation, they will experience this light in death. When a being goes towards and into the light, they're reversing the process of manifestation. The process of reincarnation for most beings is a mix of determinism and free will. It's not very different than your choices are in your waking life. You're in essence choosing things in life, but there are so many unconscious factors that determine the choices you make, and so we can't really call them conscious choices. On top of this, the law of mirroring, which, as you know, is often called the law of attraction, applies to the process of reincarnation. 
For example, you may subconsciously be acting with only yourself in mind. And this may cause you to choose a certain life that you believe will benefit you on a conscious level, while also deterministically lining up with a life where, say, the environment is every man for himself. This is one reason why the process of awakening, awareness, and becoming conscious in your life is so incredibly important as it applies to your successive incarnations. People looking to master enlightenment step out of determinism and into a position of free will and conscious choice relative to their incarnations. Soon, even incarnating at all into a separate identity within the collective consciousness that we call God or Source or the universe is in and of itself a choice. For death to happen, it must actually be a choice. In fact, no matter how badly the body is damaged, the consciousness, which we would call the non-physical perspective, must still choose to withdraw from the physical. And it often does, especially when the body is damaged to a certain degree. But sometimes, this is why miracles relative to near-death experiences happen. And it is also often the spiritual reason why people slip into comas instead of just die. Essentially, their temporal and non-temporal aspects do not yet agree upon death or coming back into life. My message for you is, do not worry for those who have died. Don't worry for someone who has died. They are not suffering. They experience themselves as being closer to you than they ever were in their separate physical forms. All the concern should be for those left behind, those who are still in their separate physical forms, who are feeling separate from the one they love, those who are experiencing grief and loss. To understand death, you must above all understand that death is the ultimate change. Death is not an endedness. Death is drastic change. It occurs when no further expansion can take place without changing perspectives and forms. There are many variables that add up to making it so that the only way that further expansion can happen is through death. But the sad reality is that people have a huge power relative to making that be the case or not. As it applies to humans, both individuals and social systems such as family, culture, and society create stuckness that can lead to death. For example, so many people tend to cope with what is and encourage others to cope with what is instead of to change what is. The problem is that one of the main purposes of life is expansion. It is an exercise in collective consciousness, what many call source or God, knowing itself. If this expansion does not occur within an individual and within a system because the pressure to change is met with adaptive coping mechanisms, the people's thoughts, words, and actions will continue to keep things that are not supposed to be as is, as is. And that stuckness invites death. The person who dies then expands through shifting perspectives and through shifting forms. And that person's death serves as a pressure put on the other people in the social system to start expanding again by making changes to their life. So that you can understand this better, I've got just one example. I want you to imagine a family that is dysfunctional. That dysfunction prevents all members from lining up with what is truly highest and best for them. For example, say that a mother continues to be codependent to a dictatorial father. He is enabled in his dysfunction, which is preventing his expansion. She also thwarts her own progression by virtue of being too afraid to lose the marriage. They both distract themselves from this pain by hyper-identifying with their son and by forcing him to live the life they want him to live. By doing so, they train him to prevent his own life purpose and cope with the pain of doing so. If this state of being, which quite frankly goes against the progression of all members of this family, is maintained, this son, for example, could be a match to death. The universe is not against him or the family when this death occurs. Instead, death became the only open door for him to experience the expansion that the variables of his life were opposing, and his parents no longer have him to focus on so as to avoid their own dysfunction. His tragic death essentially calls them to question everything about their lives. The universal hope is that this questioning will lead to them getting back on track with their own personal expansion. Death of any perspective is not beneficial to the universe when expansion is still being served through that perspective. And the sad truth, especially when it comes to suicide, is that so many people believe themselves to be stuck and believe that no improvement or progression or expansion can take place in their life when the reality is quite the opposite. They are simply suffering from the severe limitations of their individual perspective. To generalize, the universe itself does not 
want beings to die. There is too much value in them being alive. If there wasn't, no being would come into existence with their instincts and biology wired for survival. It is in the best interest of the universe at large for a being to stay in their current form as long as expansion and enhancement is actually occurring through that perspective, as long as the reason for life to exist in the first place is being actualized through that perspective. The value in death is really all about the value of drastic change, especially in terms of drastic change of perspective. And the truth, whether we're aware of it or not, is that it is in your hands to continue to create that expansion forward. You're actually the one in the power seat there. Having said all of this, when death happens around you, it is absolutely a calling to re-examine your life. It is a calling of your life and of life itself into question. And you would be very wise to let it be that and to get on board with the powerful objective process of reevaluating everything. One of the most life-enriching things that you can do is to live with your mortality in mind. What so many people who have had a near-death experience or who have overcome suicidality or who have grappled with a terminal illness will tell you is that the facing of death brings an invaluable gift for life. What they will tell you is that people should face death, this essential feature of life, in order to live a more rich, meaningful, and authentic life. It's all too easy to get sucked into the drama of temporal day-to-day -day life. It's all too easy to behave as if life will last forever, and it is all too easy to lose track of what really matters in the grand scheme of things. Facing death and living with the awareness that you will die one day can in fact break you free from the way that you have been, let's say, sucked into the small picture of your temporal life. It has the power to reconnect you with the bigger picture of your life here on Earth, within the grand scheme of the universe itself. Facing death will cause you to question. It will cause you to ask questions like, how will I feel about this thing that I'm doing after I'm dead? How will I feel about having spent my time on Earth in this way after I'm dead? When I am dead, will this thing matter? Am I really living? What does it mean to really truly live? Will I choose from today on to really truly live? Will I choose to live like every moment of my life matters? What does it mean to make the most of my time here on Earth? Am I making the most of my time here on Earth? Uh, how about what would I do differently so as to make the most of my time here? If I accepted that I'm going to die one day, and so the goal of life can't simply be to stay safe so as to survive, what might I be brave enough to do differently? Contrary to popular opinion, thinking about life within the context of death will cause you to make drastically different decisions and to live both fully and bravely. You must know that even if at a more objective level of reality, death is just a change in perspective, it is quite a different experience here in our temporal forms. We should not be invalidating our physical life experience and perceptions with higher dimensional awareness like so many people seem to do. One does not negate the other. This means we need to hold both the reality of loss and of no loss, of death and of no death. Don't expect or allow your awareness of the bigger picture of death to negate the physical life experience of death. Let that awareness caretake your pain, not invalidate it, and see death for what it is, the ultimate change. It is my deepest hope that this awareness will help you to live the fullest, the most meaningful, and the most joyful life possible. Have a good week.